Good afternoon. Thank you again for coming. My name is Greg Moynihan. I'm the co-director of the Science, Technology, and Society program here at Bard, and I teach in the history program. Uh, we're moving on now to a panel, Will Machines Realize Their Potentials as Masters of Man or Masters of Humanity? Uh, we're fortunate to have with us Babette Babich, uh, Jean-Gabriel Ganesia, and James Hughes. Uh, and they'll be looking at a question that really touches on something we addressed in other panels yesterday. Is there a difference between human and machine? Uh, what happens to humans after uh, human beings become replaced economically, militarily? Uh, and I think this will touch on a number of other themes and hopefully bring them together from yesterday. So without further ado, uh, Babette Babich. I want to thank, as everyone should thank, uh, all of us from the bottom of our hearts, uh, Roger Berkowitz. Microphone, but I met, let me say that again. I want to thank Roger Berkowitz. And, of course, I'm also grateful for the opportunity to meet and to hear from all of the other uh, participants on, on, on the panels of the, of the day, as well as this particular panel. I hope it will be useful. This, this is actually a slide, a gratuitous slide, uh, to begin with, um, as a response to Ray Kurzweil, uh, because it's sort of like... It's sort of like uh, Aubrey Gray, you know, we'll just send in the nanobots to clean out the mitochondria, and uh, the problem is the doing of that. And uh, it really presupposes from a biological and any other perspective uh, uh, the miracle, and you maybe can't see that, but, and then a miracle happens, and it's sort of like the sort of like an R, our R&D department will take care of that. And it's, a, it's something that an engineer should be more circumspect about. Uh, yes, sir. This, of course, is a, a reference with regard to Heidegger and science, but this is the actual talk. That was just gratuitous stuff. Okay. The answer, will machines re realize their potential as ma the masters of man, is yes, of course. And as, in fact, they already have, not quite as anticipated by future logical enthusiasts, but rather in the way somewhat more cautiously Jacques Ellul and Herbert Marcuse and Langdon Winner have observed, and no. As these same authors have also said, Heidegger, who spent his life reflecting on this question via the notion of humanism, also suggested that on the one hand, the threat of technology is precisely in the realization of its potential mastery, and on the other, the threat is our desire to master that mastery. I want to be taller. Machines are extensions or enhancements and vice versa, to the extent that we are machine obedient, not because we want to be, but because and simply in order to use our machines, from our autos to our cell phones and cameras, indeed and even Facebook and other websites, we have to be. The greater our obedience, the better the machine obeys our every whim. This is like playing World of Warcraft or having a Second Life avatar. The more you believe in the awkwardly drawn characters and the awkwardly drawn three-dimensional representation, the better your experience. Professor Turkle reminded us of this as the little kick we get, the reward we get for the achievement that it is to send a message and, wait for this, receive a reply. You've got mail. And machines use little bings and chimes, just like psych labs do, and that's no accident, to signal that reward. And we do wait for it. This is not just an acoustic, it's also a visual signal. That's why we look at the Apple icon when our iPhones start up and turn it off, or Windows Vista or Windows 7 and its little spinning wheel, etc. Martin Kush and Harry Collins argue that it is the same sort of machine obedience, mechanically repeated, that explains why infantry men on the ground, at the front, that is, I didn't know about this paper, the previous paper, Ron's paper, before I did this, so I'm really, it's really cool, uh, do not run from fire as one might expect them to do. They've got good reasons. They don't. Why don't they, according to Kush and Collins? They don't. And as Nietzsche, way before Cushion Collins would say, a word of warning to all multitaskers out there, as Nietzsche puts it, the chamber of human consciousness is small. <laughs> and as military psychologists well know, one can only really do one thing at a time. And if they've been sufficiently drilled, 
the soldiers will be too preoccupied, or better said, too identified with the mechanical process of loading ammunition and firing machines, serving machines, too much of an appendage of their artillery to pay attention to the shells exploding around them. Heroes and war movies depend on this mechanism. Folks with a different philosophical formation like mine call this intentionality. We project ourselves into the machine. We are our machines. Thus Heidegger in his Beiträge with uh, its last god and its fugues focused on Machenschaft, mechanization, can-do ability, along with giganticization in the sense that Jünger would speak of Titan Technique, Titanic technology. This is marvelously enough for the current context, the very imago, the imaginary, if we use the language of Jacques Lacan, of the machine in modernity. Starting, of course, as we always start, whether we're conscious of it or not, this is part of our filmic unconscious with Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, and this is so if we have not seen the movie. That was when the paper was longer, but there you go. That's not modern times, but that's where it came from. In turn, this is, that is modern times. This is Fritz Lang's Moloch. Metropolis as the city, and of course, for this is the mechanized city of the future, the city of Heidegger's Machenschaft, with a little social commentary, the commentary on which issue Heidegger came up rather notoriously short. Lang's titanic Moloch is the political machine that is the city in its verticality, its organizations, the leaders above, with creative work and dreams and time on their hands, and the workers in the dark below, with anomie and soul and, and fractured soul-robbing labor. That's why I call this marvelous owing to its consinity, my favorite musical term, with Roger Berkowitz's design schema for this conference with the Maria robot, which quickly takes us to where Kurzweil sees us going. And Fritz Lang accomplishes this transformation before our eyes in a perfectly Leibnizian spirit. This becomes a difference that seemingly makes no difference, a fatal one. Maria, the noxiously troublesome living being, just like many women from a male point of view, becomes Maria, the vastly more tractable, because programmable, robot. The, thus, the perfection of the robot is not so much that it comes to life, but that it, it, it improves on life. Maria is beautiful. If only her head were not filled with ideas about the workers. If only she kept her mind on sex and poetry. And then, after marrying, on caring for her husband's white shirts and catering to her children's happiness and keeping them quietly out of earshot. Children, like women, should be seen and not heard. Thus, Roger's conference icon for us as the emblem of this three-day conference shows us the prototype of the Maria robot before her rapturous perfection. A perfection that gives us, as Jean Lanier, light and sightfully analyzes it, not the cheaply ontic technological, but the real thing, which we take to be the technological. This uh, works, a word for Turing, Turing enthusiastics in both directions. In other words, Fritz Lang's robot was a simulacrum. The transformation that he filmed gives us movie magic, not reality. Birgitta Helm plays Maria the Human Girl, and the same actor, this is proto-Hollywood after all, plays the robot, just as we've learned to love not only Data, but Seven of Nine, the Borg bot as we impolitely call her, the Star Trek android who wears face jewelry as a fetish signifier of the machine that we know her to be. Thus we get the archetypic female, and here's a question for Tracy's reading of Kleist, Das Marionettentheater, which I read a bit differently. Would a lady who was not and was a human being, being mechanical or, up, or to update matters, being electronic or even and just digital, but who otherwise fulfilled your every male desire, would you, could you care less? Internet sex turns out to be just as fulfilling as actual sexual encounters and no awkward after-consummation moments, no discussions, no underwear to find, no Playboy magazine strategies for jettisoning the lady, no having to call or having not to call. <laughs> Our machines, ourselves. Gunther Anders, that's Gunther Anders, uh, Hannah Arendt's first husband, who was also part of the original circle of young scholars associated with the Frankfurt School, as well as having been a student of Heidegger's, made the question of this panel, and maybe this conference, the center of his life's work. In his long life, 1902 to 1996, sort of parallel to my own teacher Gadamer's length of life, Anders kept his observant powers to the last, and that's not easy. What's more, Anders kept his own attention on the changing techno 
science times around him. Nevertheless, techno-science theorists rarely talk about Anders. They've never heard of him. Just as those interested in discussing crimes against humanity rarely invoke Anders. Perhaps this is because, but this seems a silly reason, like Ivan Illich, his contemporary uh, uh, and fellow Viennese, uh, Anders came from Breslau, as did Gadamer, but moved to Vienna with his second wife. Anders was a pain in the neck. Like his nemesis, Adorno, Anders was a teaser, a heckler. And his views were out of kilter. Rather than talking about the Holocaust as a Jew, and as he might have done, though he did this too, he did all kinds of things, including music and literary theory to boot, Anders made Americans, that would be the good guys in World War II, from his perspective, and he should have been more grateful, uncomfortable by talking incessantly about Hiroshima, and even more, and even people who insist on mentioning Hiroshima do not go on, as Anders insisted on going on, to talk about Nagasaki and count almost Kabbalistically the dates of Hiroshima, the bomb detonated, as it mattered to him, on August 6, 1945, just two days later, the neat legal rubric for defining crimes against humanity would be spelled out in Nuremberg on August 8, 1945, and the very next day, the second bomb would be dropped on Nagasaki, August 9th, 1945. Like Heisenberg and like Einstein, Anders seemed to think that the problem of evil was the bomb. And like Heidegger, he also insisted that the evolution of that same problem had to do with what, unlike Heidegger, he had seen from the start as the problem of humanity itself as standing reserve. In Heidegger's terms, a resource that would, however, desperately need improving. We heard that from Ray Kurzweil. This and is called the shame of being born. This is the shame of a navel. For the mark of creation, as a creation at the hand of God, which is, and here Anders concurs with Sartre, the dream of modernity, is that we as human beings do not merely manage to be the ones who, as Nietzsche's madman tells us, kill God, you and I, and with our own hands, so that the sacred, as Nietzsche tells it, bleeds to death as we watch. But then, what about the blood? And Nietzsche goes in for excessive realism. What about the body? What about the stench? Gods, too, he tells us, decompose. Much more than merely murdering God. A piece of cake for Anders as a Jew, a secular Jew, no less. We want to take his place, but that's the kicker. We are born, not made, but we want to be machines, mechanical or as in the current age, digital. But ultimately, we want to be fabricated, to be a product with serial numbers and perhaps an ISBN, so that we can mark it and upgrade ourselves. Our shame is our genitalia. Anders had a classical education. This is our idols. We are, as he says, no product, but just, I quote him, and merely, and rather than being God, a creature, with all our creaturely insufficiency. We're finite, limited, merely human. If only we could be a God, if only we were manufactured to precision standards at the height of the technological engineering we are so sure is coming our way. Just you wait. It is Anders' figural analogy here that I find compelling, thought worthy, as Heidegger would say, God, product. The product is God. Thus, Anders goes on, one has no choice but to undertake a self-reformation, the effort to demonstrate one's own thing piety, the seduction of an imitatio instrumentorum, at the very least in the smallest degree, to make the effort to improve, today we say enhance, oneself to rectify for once and minimize to the least conceivable measure the sabotage. The human being suffers owing to his original sin, the legacy, nolens volens, willy-nilly, for those of you who have forgotten your Latin, of birth. <clears throat> for Anders, we want to correct the mistakes in our makeup, the errors that cause us to become ill, to suffer, to die. A well-made product, as René Descartes had already pointed out as part of his philosopher's proof for the existence of God, a proof that the Parisian theologians did not miss a beat with this one, also happened to be a condemnation of God's manufacturing specs. Had he, Descartes, fabricated himself, he would have done it better. QED, there has to be a God. For Anders, we today have begun to undertake this very enterprise which we call, and it's instructive for those who believe in the logarithmic evolution of techno-scientific engineering and design, that we use rather the same terms that Anders emphasizes in 1956 in English, in a German text, by speaking of human engineering. Uh, 
Thus, for Anders in his first chapter on Promethean shame, in the first volume of this book is entitled The Obsolescence of Humanity on the Soul in the Age of the Second Industrial Revolution, a book which seemingly prefigures, albeit, and Anders can't help it, in a darker modality, Ray Kurzweil's brighter enthusiasm for the natural history of humanity towards an evolutionary culmination in technological rapture. And the word rapture is not overused inasmuch as we're talking about replacement, consummation, salvation, or what do you do with the old iPhone when the new one arrives? A coming problem for iPhone owners the world over in just a few months to the 4G singularity, some of whom already have two or three in a drawer somewhere. For Anders, they caught realizing that God had created him with deficiencies. This would be the true maker's mark. The Promethean shame can be kicked up a notch. He received that, like Arendt, Anders is Heidegger's student. So he moves from Descartes to Kant. Thus we move, he says, this is him, into the obligatory. That is to say, for Anders, the moral demand is now transferred from the human to the device. What should be is the tool, the gadget. In other words, let there be not merely the human, but high technology. Here, Anders repeats the maxim that Heidegger had already identified in his Beiträge as the maxim of fascist techno-science. And this starts with the Beiträge. It's repeated by Arendt, it's repeated by Anders. Whatever is technically possible, Heidegger identifies as, na as the Nazi ethos of, tech of Nazi science, whatever is technically possible should be actualized as quickly as possible. And as Heidegger anticipated, and Anders could not but corroborate, applied with fairly dispassionate equal measure to Soviet and capitalist, a.k.a. American science alike. Quoting, quoting Anders for the last word, what can be brought to term counts now as what is now the ought. The maxim, he's quoting Nietzsche, but he doesn't tell you because Nietzsche's quoting Pindar, become what you are, is recognized as the maxim of techno-gadgets. Gadgets are the whiz kids. Die Begabten is his word of today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Babich. Our next speaker is Jean-Gabriel Ganassia. Uh, he's professor of computer science at the Pierre and Marie Curie University in University of Paris. Uh, he's the author of over 350 papers, journals and conference proceedings, as well as 10 books, the most recent of which is Voir et Pouvoir, Qui nous sauve, uh, Vision and Power, Who is Watching Us? Uh, professor Garcia. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Roger Berkovich and uh, uh, everybody uh, here for having invited me to uh, give a talk here. And also, I would like to thank all the speakers because uh, uh, all the uh, discussion, all the topics which are uh, presented, discussed there, are of interest for me. And I think it's a really interesting uh, 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 conference, fascinating conference. So, uh, I have, as a member of this panel, to answer, to try to answer to this question, will machine realize their potential as masters of man? And uh, to try to answer to this question, I uh, uh, think that maybe it's better to give some picture because in, in 10, 15 minutes, we have not really time to uh, uh, argue in detail, so it's, uh, it's uneasy. And first of all, uh, to try to answer to this question, I try to oh, decompose this question. I think that there are two, maybe two questions. Oh, maybe you, you can disagree with this. But the first question is uh, about, about the past. Did machine realize a potential as master of mine. And, oh, did this happen in, in the past? 
This is the first question. And, and the second question is about what, what is the potential? What, what does we mean exactly by uh, 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 the potential of, 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 of those machines? So, I will uh, try, as I said, by uh, 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 giving some, some metaphorical picture. The first picture comes from the French literature. Maybe some of you have read this uh, small book, which is called Au Bonheur des Dames. Uh, there was, a, I don't know exactly the English translation of this book, but there was a film which was made in the 50s, and the title of the book in uh, uh, English was, as, far as I remember, uh, Shop Girls of Paris. It was uh, 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 about the oh, new commerce, this new consumer society which birthed in the end of this 19th century in big cities in the world, especially in Paris, but also, uh, I suppose, in New York and in London and, and in many different cities. And why? did I present this uh, uh, book? Because it has nothing uh, uh, to do with machine. Because in the beginning of this book, there was something which was mentioned, which was oh, very important, I think, for the book, which was a uh, notion of headless woman. It's a strange thing, the headless woman. Just a parenthesis. Uh, there was, oh, in, in, in Paris, a small street which was called the Headless Woman. It, it is in the center of Paris, in the uh, uh, Ile de la Cité, and oh, some very famous people lived in this street, especially, I think, Baudelaire was living there. But uh, this, uh, this has nothing to say with, with this. Uh, uh, when uh, 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 Zola mentioned this uh, Headless Woman, he wants to speak about uh, oh, something which appealed to the heroines in the windows of the store. It was one of the first big stores in Paris. And what, what she say, uh, uh, she saw? She saw here this uh, dummy, uh, 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 which head was replaced by a level uh, 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 with a price. And I think it's very interesting because uh, it's metaphors of uh, uh, the consumer society which birthed at this time. And it's a metaphor of, of the evolution of the, of the society. So you say, oh, there is no machine. But I think that maybe uh, the machine tried to reduce people just to the body. And it was, I think, the role of the machine in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So it's the first first place of the machine. It's a matter, as I say, it's just a metaphor. And just to go further, I would like to mention an other poet, I think you uh, know him, it's uh, 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 Alfred Jarry. And he wrote a nice book which was called uh, Ubu King. And in this night book, you have some uh, I don't know how, how to tell it. It's a very strange king, uh, a terrible king. And he used a machine, which was very emblematic of this role of machine in this uh, beginning of the 20th century. And this machine, he called it the disembraining machine. I have no idea clearly of what was this machine. So uh, uh, I took a picture which was uh, 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 drawn by Max Ernst. It's a piece of, of a small book, which I, I really like the title, because uh, the, the title is 100 Head Woman. But in French, it means, oh, uh, uh, the headless woman is la femme sans tête, and the hundredless woman is uh, la femme sans tête. But, uh, 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 <laughs> so, just, I think it's, it's a picture of this disembraining machine. But, this is just a parenthesis. What is, what is very interesting is to try to answer to the first question. The picture, which is on the booklet of this uh, conference, is drawn from Fritz Lang uh, Metropolis. And maybe it's a sign, which means that, OK, this was uh, one, the, the goal of this, of this machine in the uh, 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 first 
uh, uh, half and maybe in uh, 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 the main part of the 20th century was to replace the head of people. So this is why this notion, I think, of headless uh, 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 woman is uh, 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 very interesting because it's metaphoric of the role of the machine. And maybe it's, uh, you remember, one, one of the questions what was about the potential of those uh, 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 machine as master of mind. Maybe the first potential was to replace the head of people. But now maybe I can, I can go uh, 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 further. And what is very interesting is that today things seem to change. And I have some good news in a way because uh, Oh, two good news. The first, I say is that, uh, yes, oh, uh, machine realize their potential as master of mind, uh, uh, of men, sorry, uh, uh, in the beginning of the uh, uh, 20th century. But I think that uh, maybe it's, it's finished. And, and, and the second good news is that the potential of machine is not only to replace our head, it's just to help us. It's just to uh, uh, be some... Uh, aid for us. And uh, here are some examples of those uh, 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 machines which are uh, designed to uh, 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 help us to empower uh, uh, people. The idea is to, is to make things easier. And oh, one of the concepts which was developed, but we have many other concepts, is this here of hand-free equipment. Or the first entry equipment is uh, uh, just to uh, uh, help to phone without having to, 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 to take the, the phone with, with our hand. Uh, or maybe this strange uh, uh, camera which was designed to take picture without having to uh, uh, worry about uh, 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 keeping in hand the, 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 the camera. And the last, which I, I really like, is this umbrella which is uh, 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 an entry umbrella. So, I think, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> those are examples of the new kind of machine we are designing now. And I think, yes, yeah, so the new computer are designed to, not to reply places, but to make things easier for us. So it's, it's, very, it's very positive. So we cannot imagine now that uh, the machine with, uh, 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 will try to become master of man. Okay, you agree with this. But there is, there is something which is very emblematic of this, of this evolution. And it is what we call BCI. You know what it means? It means brain-computer interface. You know what it is? It is, oh, the idea is just to put some electrodes inside the brain, or maybe just you can put some uh, 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 thing out, outside of the brain. But the idea is, is, oh, when you are thinking to something, your brain has some electrical activity. And then this electrical activity can be correlated to what you are thinking. For, for instance, you are seeing a screen, uh, a computer screen, and you want to move the cursor on the right. So you think you want to move the cursor on the right, and you record your electrical activity. And then with artificial intelligence technique, and mainly with uh, machine learning technique, you are able, able to correlate the signal with uh, this uh, 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 idea. And then what can happen? It's marvelous. You can easily uh, 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 move, for instance, here, it's a, it's a picture. I saw it, I think it was in the uh, uh, MIT Tech Review. And this guy is a student. He has a wheelchair. And he's just with his mind. You see, he has some uh, 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 EEG on his head. And just with his mind, he's able to drive his wheelchair, which is really marvelous. It's, um, it's an idea of what, what we can do today with uh, our uh, uh, techniques. So, now, it's uh, the conclusion of this is, uh, oh, we, there are many projects, both in Europe and in the United States, and maybe also in Japan, I don't know, uh, concerning those uh, brain-computer interface. And a lot of money, hundreds of uh, uh, millions of euros, 
are uh, 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 are given to, to those projects. So one of the questions is, yes, it's, it's really fascinated. I think you are all fascinated by this kind of thing. But why is it useful? One of the justification for this is uh, 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 people who are uh, a lot of disabilities who uh, cannot move, cannot speak, and they are conscious. So patients are called a locked-in patient. And I think it would be really interesting, and from an ethical point of view, it would be very useful to use those techniques to help them. But I have three questions. The first question is that, okay, it's, uh, it's very useful, but the number of locked-in patients is, is very low. And uh, the cost of those equipment, the cost of the research is very high. And how many young child in Africa or in different parts of the world can be cured or saved with this money? This is the first or maybe it's just an utilitarian question, but it's a real question. The second question is a more practical question, because if you want to be trained with those techniques, you need to speak. And it's very difficult to train people without speaking. So maybe it's a practical question. Maybe we can solve it in the future. But the third question is an ethical question. Because if you are locked in passion, how can you express your consent. You are unable to write, you are unable to speak. And so it's a, it's a, it's a real question. So why did I present this uh, example? Because I think this notion of brain-computer interface, which uh, uh, excites, which uh, 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 interests many, many people in the world, I think it is symptomatic of uh, our world, and I think the role of the machine is not only the role of the machine toward the individual, it's the collective role of the machine. The role of the machine is a society. I think the machines are transforming the uh, 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 way, the medium between people. So it is transforming politics. And I think in a way, or oh, individual, uh, 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 individuals, sorry, uh, 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 they feel more powerful with many machines because uh, they are able to uh, 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 speak each other, to express ex many, many things, and to exchange with many people. But I think, as member of the collectivity, as citizen, it's more and more difficult to act. It's more and more difficult to feel powerful. I think that, in a way, we feel all handless with those new techniques. And so it's a metaphor of our uh, society with machines. And I think, yes, here are uh, uh, some uh, 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 tools which were developed, uh, I, I think in the, in the DARPA maybe, which are exoskeleton, which help to uh, increase, to empower our uh, uh, individuals. But I think that uh, 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 on, this, uh, on the other hand, on the first hand, so we are empowered by those technique. But on the other hand, I think as citizen, as member of the political community, and this is maybe the reason why I, I was very happy to uh, uh, be there in this Anna Haren Center, I think it's more and more difficult to to play your role, your political role in, 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 in the police. And so, it's a conclusion about the question, will machine realize a potential as a master of man? I will not answer. I think it would be unethical to answer to this question, but I'm always afraid of that. <laughs> Thank you very much, President Gnassia. Uh, our next speaker is James T. Hughes. He's the executive director. James T. Hughes. Uh, James J. Hughes, uh, director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies at Trinity College. 
Uh, he's previously been the executive director of the World Transhumanist Association. Uh, his most recent book is Citizen Cyborg, Why Democratic Societies Must Resi Respond to the Redesigned Human of the Future. Thank you very much. Well, I, thank you. I hope to respond to some of the concerns about powerlessness. That's uh, the latter part of my talk. The first part of my talk is a bit of, bit of a response to the discussion yesterday about the singularity. Um, and I want to start by addressing one of the questions that was discussed, which is, is there a distinction between human and machine? For me, the idea of humanness is profoundly homo fabricans. We are the creature that creates ourselves. We're the, we were defined by uh, the invention of fire and the created environment that we have made. Uh, the first time we began to download our consciousness was with the written word. It was when we were able to put our thoughts onto external tablets and papyri and then re-upload them again later. So the, the division, the ontological division between human and machine is, I think, problematic, and especially problematic when it becomes applied to the notion of some distinction between who we are today and who we might be tomorrow as a more created being, as a more fabricated being, a cyborg. Um, for me, the idea of creating that kind of sharp division between human and cyborg implicates us in the sin I call human racism, or, uh, which has many of the same features of, of racism, that it, it creates a false uh, ontological reification of who, uh, what a human being is, separating it from animals, from continuity with other kinds of, of beings. And for me, what's much more important about recognizing, and this was a question that Sherry Turkle addressed, is that it's not about machine versus human so much. It's about what are the characteristics of our experience and of the experiences of others that we value and that we want to put moral weight on. And for me, that's personhood. And personhood is not bounded by biological humanness. So what is the singularity? Um, I want to briefly uh, uh, take that idea apart. The first part you heard a good bit about yesterday, uh, it's a set of overlapping concepts. And one of those concepts is accelerating technological change. And I'll define my own ideas about that in a second. The second is the notion of a radical historical discontinuity. The, uh, akin to the emergence of Homo sapiens, that we may be on the, the cusp of some kind of radical discontinuity in history. And the third is the idea of greater than human intelligence. Um, some people who talk about the singularity aren't as focused on that. Uh, others are, think that that's the only impart, uh, important part, whether it brings historical discontinuity or whether there's accelerating change or not. Um, they're most focused on the creation of greater than human machine intelligence, which could then bootstrap itself into weak godhood, as it's sometimes called. And um, I think it's inescapable, as was mentioned yesterday, that this is uh, that all of the people who are in this subculture uh, manifest sublimated millennialism of one form or another. It's been referred to as the rapture of the nerds. And I, I, and I think that the... It's, it's, it's inescapable that they do. All of the uh, over-optimism of, uh, of millennialists, all, all the over-pessimism about apocalyptic outcomes, um, notions of messianic solutions that might come out of the laptop of one person or another, it's all there. The question, of course, is that in a thousand years ago, you might have uh, been a, a, an apocalyptic who expected fire to rain from the sky, and today you can be uh, similarly apocalyptic, expecting fire to rain from the sky, but fire may actually rain from the sky. So the fact that there is a millennialist psychoculture around this uh, may create cognitive biases about the likelihood of one outcome or another, but it doesn't mean that the particular projections that are being made are false ones. So what are some of the scenarios that people in this space, as you've heard, uh, discuss? Well, one is transhuman augmentation. And Kurzweil is, within the group of people who talk about these ideas, he is one of the most humanistic of the people because he is actually focused on the question of how uh, greater than human intelligence will become merged with our humanity and uh, permit human augmentation and human enhancement in ways that could be potentially empowering for, for everyone. So you may have been horrified to hear what he had to say, but in terms of the space, he is actually on the humanistic end of that. 
Uh, there are others who are completely pessimistic about the possibility of human enhancement and uh, humans overcoming their meat biases, their, their meat brain biases, and look forward to the creation of a literal deus ex machina, a literal god from the machine who could solve all of our problems by creating some kind of friendly, benevolent super AI. There are others who, uh, like Taylor de Chardin and uh, uh, um, the Meta Man, written by Greg Stock, uh, people who project various kinds of emergent intelligence in the world, who see the greater than human intelligence coming out of organizations and governments and the internet, and uh, they expect at some point there might be a phase transition where it wakes up, the internet or the planet or all of humanity wake up and begin to function as the neurons of one global brain. So this is another aspect of that millennialism. And then there are the folks who are the apocalyptics, uh, who believe in a hard, bad takeoff. And you're not necessarily in one or the other camp because some of the folks who uh, believe in super AI I think it's the only thing that could save us from the hard, bad Terminator takeoff. You know, that it, as soon as it, if we don't have a, a benevolence coded into, you know, if Ron isn't successful in coding ethics into, uh, into robots, then the robots that emerge will be the, the bad Terminator robots, and the only thing that could save us is the good ones. Now, where am I in this space? Um, I think that there are signs of technological acceleration, so I don't discount that. And I think that that means that policy wonks like myself need to take seriously uh, technological, ethical policy questions that many currently discount as science fiction. I think there will probably be radical civilizational change in this century, but of course that's, you know, <laughs> of course there will be some kind of radical change, the question is what kind. And I take seriously utopia, both utopian and apocalyptic possibilities. So I'm not entirely that far from a Kurzweilian kind of perspective. I also take quite seriously that we're going to make a lot of progress with human enhancement, uh, with uh, smart drugs, gene therapy, tissue engineering, nanorobotics. I think that uh, we have already developed, as you heard from Sherry Turkle, the notion that our external uh, electronic devices, our exocortices, we've basically begun to offload parts of our function. There's actually a philosophical theory, the extended mind thesis, which explores this, how, in fact, we can't just think about our brains as what happens inside our head anymore. It's actually part of our environment. And I think this will uh, develop, as we heard, into brain-computer interfaces and eventually uh, backups for the brain and, and uploads of the brain. I'm also optimistic about, or op perhaps not optimistic, I believe that it's quite possible that we will develop some kind of self-aware, self-guided uh, machine intelligence in this century, in the next 50 years. I'm a sociologist, so I'm not really compelled to give a timeline to it, but um, I think Consciousness is a material phenomenon. There's nothing supernatural about it. But whatever is going on in the brain will eventually be able to be modeled in software, and then we will have some kind of uh, software intelligence. I also believe that software intelligence is potentially extremely dangerous. The robot on the left is uh, an early science fiction version of a robot that wakes up and takes over the world that actually had reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape. You know, so when it began to think about taking over the world, the reels were spinning in the computer. Um, the robot on the right is named number six from Battlestar Galactica, an extremely dangerous robot responsible for human genocide. Um, I also believe that self-aware AI will be dangerous for the particular reason that it will be radically alien. I think that there are aspects of intelligence that develops from a mammalian body that are underappreciated for sure, for sure by the people who are trying to develop artificial intelligence. The, the aspects of embodiment such as mirror neurons or an experience of hunger in your stomach or sexual desire, all the different kinds of things which which provide a base for human emotion and for empathy with others are uh, not captured by trying to get a robot to recognize an expression of a smile or a frown in somebody else's, else's face and respond appropriately. We really have to uh, have a much more deeper concept of how uh, mammalian our cognition is, and that's beginning to be developed, uh, but uh, certainly any kind of robot that would develop out of a box now without that would be, have a radically different cognition. 
I'm for uh, efforts to develop empathetic robots. There's a lot of work being done on uh, affective computing and efforts to model emotions such as guilt or um, uh, other uh, love, empathy, other kinds of emotions into computer software. It's a very rudimentary stage. And I'm somewhat pessimistic about this because um, unlike many of the engineers who work in this space, um, I'm much more, uh, I'm, I'm closer or more open to the notion of emergent phenomenon. When I look around at the kinds of artificial life that's already evolving out in the internet, uh, worms and viruses and uh, just strange weird things that happen on the net, I'm, I'm much more open to the notion that intelligence as an emergent phenomenon wouldn't necessarily happen as a, as a designed something that you do in a particular supercomputer. And I think that that means that um, we are much greater risk than even the, some of the uh, advocates for intelligence uh, artificial intelligence say. Now, at the, artificial, at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, we work on what we call techno-progressive policy. We're basically left of center folks um, who take these kinds of technological scenarios seriously. We are open and uh, advocates for life extension technologies and for um, other kinds of uh, enhancing, human enhancing technologies, but extremely concerned about uh, liberty questions and egalitarianism. We're advocates of the Enlightenment, of the, the, the left-wing version of the Enlightenment. Uh, we want to see a, a rational, egalitarian, uh, liberal world um, where people can uh, experience the benefits of these technologies. And so we've been trying to develop policies that steer a course between the uh, Luddism of many progressives and the libertopianism of many of the people who are advocates for these technologies today. As you heard yesterday, you know, kind of the unintentional Marxism of, well, uh, if we just radically pursue capitalism, then eventually all of our problems will be taken care of and capitalism will self-destruct. It was kind of ironic. Uh, not, I don't think you recognize the irony of it, but uh, you know, many of the people in that space think, well, eventually all of our problems will be solved by uh, cheap nano replicators that will spit out uh, you know, cheap goo for us to eat, and uh, you won't have to worry about, uh, you know, there'll be no, there'll be no more scarcity because of these technologies. So what are some of the things that we promote? Well, the first is that um, as the Werner Vinge, who was one of the first coiners of the term singularity uh, back 20 years ago, he argued, well, you can either have artificial intelligence take over the world or we could try to stay smart ourselves. We could have intelligence augmentation that would keep ourselves uh, one step ahead of how and try to uh, make sure that the machines don't actually dominate us, that we dominate the machines. And I think that's one of the courses that we should pursue. I think another, and this is where the libertarians uh, in this space are completely averse. They, as soon as you raise the question of any kind of government regulation of dangerous AI or, or software, they immediately balk and say, well, governments are too slow, they're too stupid, it wouldn't help, uh, you know, it would take fascism, blah, 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 blah. There already are efforts around the world to control the spread of dangerous uh, software, dangerous technologies that could be applied to this. And there's already a global effort to, not a terribly successful global effort, but a global effort to create agreements and international policing arrangements to crack down uh, on cybersecurity, criminal uses of artificial intelligence or, or worms as they are today, um, uh, cyber warfare and other kinds of things in that space. We need to uh, be focused on these as the first bulwark against the future kinds of software threats we may face in the future. As you heard yesterday, there is a threat of structural unemployment. I think it's not just a threat, it's a very real. Of course, leftists have been proposing that we would be able to eliminate all labor for about 150 years um, and uh, expecting it right around the corner and it's never quite happened. But I think we are at the cusp in the next couple decades of uh, creating software and robotics which eliminate vast swaths of all conceivable labor that human beings could do, that the robots will do everything that we think we could do better than we do it, cheaper. Um, and in that kind of a scenario, there will be widespread structural unemployment. And, we, and I am open to that because I don't think that the goal of being a human being is to work at a wage slavery job. I think it is, like Marx thought, to be able to get up in the morning and write some poetry if you want and farm in the afternoon if you want and do whatever the hell you want. 
Um, uh, we will need to, you know, those of us who think that the only way to find fulfillment th is through wage slavery will have to reorient in that future civilization. But I think that is a positive future. But we're not going to get there without political struggle. And that's what you heard yesterday, is that the folks who are advocating the kind of libertopian solutions here are completely ignoring the fact that, and, uh, you know, that we're having riots in France over the extension of the retirement age. We need to have policies that actually address how we get there. We also need to be talking about robot rights, and since I'm not terribly sanguine about uh, robots ever having the kind of uh, sentience and uh, emotions that I would want to grant rights to as citizens of our polity, um, I think we need to think about um, how we keep them from ever getting into the situation where we would feel morally obliged to provide them rights. So this is the question of how do you keep it at below that threshold where eventually you might say, well, now you're not just a dog anymore, now you're actually a human level intelligence and I have to really consider your rights seriously. And um, because if we create human or greater than human intelligences and s enslave them somehow, I think that this is, in fact, a moral problem. One of the ways that we can get around that is to um, pursue what Kurzweil was pointing to, which is to use artificial intelligence to enhance cognition, to augment human cognition, to always keep a meat brain driving the artificial intelligence. And it's not necessarily a meat brain because we also, if we get to the point where we can upload and reverse engineer our own brains, download our brains into software, then those experiences, those memories, those personalities in, in software may then carry over sufficient amount of our mammalian heritage to be an acceptable part of our polity. But I don't want to just see something that evolves from being a toaster into a, a, a sentience um, necessarily have to have that kind of a status. I think we also have to address the question, and again, the folks in this space are completely um, uh, deaf to this kind of a question, but um, if you create powerful tools and technologies which pose threats to others, we already have extensive licensing understandings. If you want to drive a car, you have to prove that you're moral enough and you're educated enough in how to use that particular piece of technology not to kill people immediately when you get on the road. And if you violate that understanding, then that right gets taken away. Uh, the same thing for guns, whether we agree with the particular gun policy or not. Uh, if artificial intelligence of other kinds of software pose those kinds of threats, and we already have international agreements that recognize certain kinds of software do, um, but if they pose those kinds of threats and we wanted ordinary people to have access to them, then there would have to be some kind of license, licensure, uh, some kind of agreement about who would have access and who wouldn't. So that's what we're working on at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. And um, please visit us if you have any further questions and email me as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Hughes. Um, in my hurry to move us from our previous panel, I forgot to properly introduce Professor Babbitt. My apologies for that. She is professor of philosophy at Fordham University. Her most recent book is Nietzsche's Wissenschaftsphilosophie uh, from Oxford and Bern, and she's also the executive editor of New Nietzsche Studies. I think we have a fascinating array of questions on the table. Um, I would just sort of note historically, it's interesting, you know, that originally Luddites were attacking the frames, the sort of manufacturing base uh, mechanism, something that started already with the guilds in the 16th century, went on through attacks on the Jacquard loom uh, by the guilds of Lyon. But really, even already by the 1920s, the idea of a hybrid machine, uh, for instance, Karl Chapek's first use of the term is for a sort of biological, mechanical machine in uh, Rusim's Universal Robots. So this theme goes way back of a sort of hybridity, and I think the problem of the uh, exponential increase of information technology makes this an altogether new and more pressing problem. So let's take questions from the floor. Since our time's a bit limited, maybe we'll take a couple of questions at once and then have the panel answer them. Yes, in the back there. Do we have a microphone? Ah, there it is. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to, uh, uh, Dr. Hughes, this is actually a question for you. Um, we, I, I've read some in the transhumanist community, the, some of the writings, and there's a almost worship, if you will, for the rational and intelligence in general. And I'm curious whether you might be able to speak to uh, a, a lot of, uh, Dr. Arkin talked about the blind spots 
of humans uh, due to emotion, cognitive uh, capacities, and such. And I'm curious whether you think there are similar blind spots in AIs as they're being formulated by someone in the singularitarian community and what those blind spots would be. Because on some level, it sounds like they start from the premise intelligence can fix everything, therefore more intelligence is the answer to any problem. And while I don't have a good answer to that, intuitively I think, wait a second, every system has a blind spot. So I'm curious as to whether, and I think you spoke about this a little bit with mammalian emotions, but I hoped you could elaborate. Sure. Uh, by the way, I plug, we're organizing a conference called Problems of Transhumanism on December 5th at University of Pennsylvania, so anybody who wants to come can. Um, and one of the things that we're going to be addressing there is a series of essays that I've been writing at the IET uh, about the problems that we inherited from the Enlightenment, one of which is the, um, the fact that reason is not self-validating and, is not, and doesn't, is not normative. Um, so this problem, the Humean uh, is ought gap, um, which many, uh, you know, male uh, computer programmer types who are involved in this community um, think, well, all you really need is just to be more rational and then everybody can do what they want with their, with their reason, and they don't really dig very much deeper than that. Um, so yes, I think that is one of the problems. Um, I think, uh, you know, we need to uh, be more serious about ethical and emotional content in reason and the ways that, that they interact. So Demacia's work, for instance, I think is, is illuminating around that. Does that answer your question? A little bit? Yes. Uh, well, I'd say there are many blind spots, but one of the blind spots is certainly that uh, thinking that all we need in the world is more intelligence or more rationality uh, is not a sufficient answer to the world's problems. Uh, yes. Um, Langdon Winner uh, has pointed out the latent and manifest uh, dangers in technology, especially in in the emerging of technology. And I'm wondering, just to build upon uh, this notion of blind spots, if all of the panelists could address these latent and manifest dangers, uh, and let me just give you one example of YouTube, that originally YouTube wanted to democratize uh, video, and for a time they did. But there was also a problem of copyright infringement or uh, opening people to violence. And so I wonder if the transhumanism and the move towards singularity, if there's a real critical, if there's real critical reflection being done on what the latent dangers in enthusiastically embracing this uh, might entail. Maybe we'll take another question and then we'll have the panel answer as a whole. Professor Strong and Blackburn in front. There are actually two, two things which have been bothering me for the last day and a half, and they're, they're, they're related to each other. One is one only has to live a very short time to realize that there are experiences in human life when one finds oneself caught between two, three, or four equally rational, equally compelling demands which are incompatible with each other. And the general tendency in people who have been, so starting with Kurzweil yesterday, is to, is to talk about consistency being a good thing, whereas consistency seems to me absolutely antithetical to the human experience, and that therefore machines are in some sense always going to be other in a radical way from human experience, no matter what kind of merging happens, and I think that's something. The second is... Oh, what? <laughs> Sorry, the, sec the second is that all the way through this, there has been a use of the word we, and it refers to a whole variety of things. When I asked Kurtzfeil yesterday, he gave an answer which didn't respond to it, but the we for him was the U.S. Army and himself. <laughs> the we for Mr. Rose yesterday is NASA and a bunch of people at Google. Uh, James, you used the word we again and again. 
the presumption here seems to be that this we is universally neutral, even when it includes Dick Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have each of the panelists address these uh, questions. Maybe. Well, uh, I'm, I shouldn't start, but I will in any case. Uh, just to start with the second part of the question, because I think the first, part, the first question is, is, is complicated and is better perhaps uh, uh, addressed uh, by Professor Hughes, um, uh, but that, that's a question of consistency. Uh, the question with, with regard to the we, this is, oh, I, think it's a, I always think it's a kind of a, an artifact or an epiphenomenon of a kind of fixation on Cavell, uh, and how shall we, or Austin, maybe it really goes back to Austin, how shall we use our pronouns? Now, that, that's not to say it's not an important question. It's not to say, Tracy, that you're not absolutely spot on with that question. But I use the word we conscientiously to say that all of us are implicated whether we want to be or not. And it's very, very nice to switch back when then we all become sociologists to an us and a them or the they. And I think, and it's, you would think as a Heideggerian I'd be particularly interested in the one or the they, das man. But I do think that the point of das man is that that is who we are for the most part. We, whether we, even if we oppose the other we that we use sometimes, the we is a shifter. It's the first person pronoun. And like the I, it refers to me or you or anyone else. So that would be my tiny answer. Okay. Uh, I would like to answer two, two questions. The first question, I think it's a very interesting question. First of all, I, I would like to recall that term. Um, the initial goal of art financiation was not to replicate uh, 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 some uh, intelligent uh, 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 man. The initial goal in uh, 1956, uh, 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 when uh, people met at Dasmus College, was, and, and it, it is very precisely described, was to decompose intelligence in many different aspects and to decompose it so precisely that those different aspects can be uh, simulated by a machine. For instance, you decompose intelligence in reasoning, in uh, 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 vision, understanding, etc. And uh, 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 from, from this respect, I, 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 I'm not sure I, I completely agree with uh, what, what you were saying about uh, uh, the future of art orientation. But the second point, which was your, your point, is it, uh, yes, I agree with you. When you have an agent, and this is the role of art finite agent, to simulate agent, when you have an agent, uh, 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 what uh, uh, the agent has? He has uh, a goal, which is an external goal usually, and then he tries to solve this goal using uh, machine, uh, 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 using problem solving techniques, sorry. And then he can uh, check if this goal obey to some rules, so it can add some other constraints, which are ethical constraints, as Ron Arkin said uh, 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 this uh, uh, morning. Then the, the last point of, about the consistency. AI uh, 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 tried uh, uh, to uh, solve this problem, because uh, many AI problems uh, 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 doesn't uh, 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 really solve this problem of, of, of consistency. And especially in the 80s, but uh, uh, it continues also, you have many formalism of AI which try to deal with inconsistent world, and, and especially this notion of non-monotonic reasoning is very important from, from this respect. So I, I have no time to go in detail, but this is exactly the type of question that AI tried to solve last uh, uh, 30 years uh, 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 now. Um, I, I would like, if possible, to answer to, to the second question, because I think, but uh, very, very quickly, I think it is the important point, because I think the uh, role of the machine is not only to change the individuals. I think the main effect of this development, massive development of machine in our society is to change the politics. And I think, yes, we as a, a society is changing now with, with the machine. So I, I, I could develop, but I think I, I would not have time. But I, I completely agree with you. It's a key point if you want to understand uh, and to answer to the question, which is our question. Uh, 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 the uh, 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 realization of the potential of the machine in the future. 
Well, I, I completely agree that um, the question of identity is central, and that's where I started, was with the question of is the reification of humanness as a category um, a sufficient uh, humanistic move for, for ethics? I don't think it is. I think it has a lot of negative downsides. To give you an example, I'm an advocate for the Great Ape Project, which wants to recognize and extend human rights to uh, apes, bonobos, and chimpanzees on the grounds that they share all the relevant moral cognitive categories with us that we would like to, to confer rights on. Um, similarly, at the other end of the spectrum, those who would talk about post-human as an identity or human as an identity, I think are reifying, unfortunately, a false dichotomy. We are all becoming transhuman of some kind. We, as I said, human is transhuman already. So um, f to use my Buddhist language, the prefer my preferred identity is as a member of the sentient beings, all sentient beings. Uh, if you're not a sentient being, then I don't have to worry about you. If you're a sentient being, I have to worry about you. But sentient being is not something that's genetically coded in being human, necessarily. Um, now, the second question about consistency, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the trolley problem, but um, basically one of the ethical experiments that are being done in experimental philosophy is you give people scenarios about whether they would push somebody onto the tracks to uh, stop a, a train from killing other people or would pull a lever, and um, we discovered that our monkey brains have a moral aversion to pushing someone but not to pulling levers, and that you know uh, cer certain kinds of moral actions um, are coded into us, which seem inconsistent from a utilitarian point of view or from a deontological point of view. Um, Wendell Wallach has written a book called Moral Machines, and Wendell's one of the uh, interlocutors with, with Ron about these questions. And I know that Wendell argues explicitly against the notion that we want um, consistent moral machines because uh, the kinds of consistency, when we see actual moral consistency in other human beings, we're horrified. You know, the, the kind of human being who has no compunction about pushing a fat man onto the tracks to stop a train um, and uh, is the kind of person that we don't want to be standing next to. Um, <laughs> so that, you know, uh, similarly, I think we would not be comfortable with a world of moral machines. He has argued that virtue ethics is a, more, a far better model for how to develop uh, morality in machines, and I'm compelled by that. Let's take a, another couple of questions. Uh, yeah, down on the left. We'll wait for the microphone. Uh, this, this is building on a uh, concern that Tracy raised and that I've been having for the last day and a half listening to many presentations. So it's really directed to all of you, not only about the collapsing of categories between intelligence, uh, rationality, and consciousness, but and the absence of any serious discussion of emotional intelligence, if I can use that term, or just the notion of our emotional being, but also uh, the apparent ignorance about uh, many other sensory dimensions. You mentioned sentient, but I'm thinking of many other sensory dimensions of being human that actually are um, connected not to a kind of autonomous, everything in the human is in the brain inside my one single head conceptualization. But if you think of the world through the phenomenon of human touch, and one of your slides had, for example, the uh, cradling of a child, a rather large child, I might add, uh, by a so-called primitive robot, and mentioned that, that that connected with the notion of the development of empathy. I wonder what kinds of investigations are taking place about this much larger notion of consciousness, which includes emotionality and all of our senses, not just the ones that can be embedded in my retina, but the notion that connects me to another person as well as other beings in the world. <laughs> yeah, uh, Thomas, right, right there. Yes, uh, I'm uh, interested by the fact that we have on the panel a philosopher, a sociologist, and a computer scientist. So if there's time, I'd be interested to hear from each of you how you envision uh, the most productive dialogue between people in, the, in computer science, people in philosophy. What, what is the model that would be most productive going forward for addressing these issues? What kinds of conversations? How would that be institutionally uh, set up? What sort of conferences like this? Uh, um, collaborative projects? What is it from your, how, how do you imagine the discussion going forward? 
Okay, let's maybe pause there. That seems like a lot to put on the plate. That, 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 that's a lot. Um, if I could answer first to the, to the uh, first and, and to me striking question about uh, consciousness before going to the interdisciplinary question, which is something we all negotiate and should be negotiating uh, at every moment of our academic and uh, pedagogic lives, uh, as well as speaking to one another. Uh, the problem with, 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 and this is maybe something also to, to, to speak to, to the co-panelists and maybe to the question of interdisciplinarity, the problem of artificial intelligence embodies one of the difficulties that the philosophers have had for a long, long time about so-called other minds. And one of the difficulties for me, uh, the dissonances, is that when we speak, when Ray Kurzweil speaks, when uh, Mr. Rose speaks of the intelligence of machines, the, the bar is incredibly low. When we speak, by contrast, and this bothers me deeply, when we speak about, and this was just mentioned with regard to, 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 to uh, uh, the Great Apes Project, or even squirrels, dogs, dolphins, anything, large cephalopods, that would be, you know, the octopus that made those predictions. If, if when we speak about animals, the bar is high. And no matter what psychologists do, and whenever they show us that great apes and that pigs, pigs, especially pigs, turn out to have higher than expected cognitive capacities, we turn around and say, doesn't count. <laughs> and, and because we have to experiment on them, because we have to eat them, uh, because we must slaughter them, what else would we do with them? I'm talking about horses. The clever Hans example. So, what, but, but, but the disconnect gets to me because, it's, as an academic and as a philosopher, I work on its terms. Artificial intelligence doesn't really have to do much. The Turing test is easy. I just have to be clever Hans. I just have to fool you. I merely need to be programmed and reply to the trainer in a sufficiently elegant way for me to count as intelligent. If I am Hans, I'm off to the knackers. I'm off to the horse slaughterer. And that is also tragic when we think of those apes that we teach to sign. And Roger Houts, who works with this, uh, uh, reports very, very tragically to me that when he goes to visit, he, he, he was, he was at, at Stony Brook, so I know something about it. When he goes to where I started, he, when he goes to visit these apes, they still remember to sign. And when he speaks to the people who have been keeping them, they sign pathetically and desperately as they are experimented upon to people who have no idea, because they do not read sign language, what they are saying. So once we teach our slaves to speak, we then forget that we've, because of, you know, the grant has come to an end, and that's the end of that. That's exactly why it happened, that those that wash out that all of these signing great apes are moved. Not because we suddenly decide the end of that, but because scientists are in it for the money, and they simply move on, whether they work with living beings or not. Well, to address the two cultures problem, I, I've worked in bioethics for about 20 years. And I think, in my experience, um, applied ethics is one of those domains in which you have very fruitful uh, dialogue, where you get doctors and lawyers and philosophers to sit down together and try to hammer out various kinds of applied questions. Um, this cult, uh, conference, for me, is a little bit on the other extreme of the humanities. I haven't been around uh, this level of discourse since I was a graduate student. Um, so uh, it's quite welcome, um, but I'm not quite sure how I could address a Heideggerian question about any of this. Um, the question of senses, I think, is extremely important. Um, I'm also a Buddhist, a uh, uh, former Buddhist scholar, and um, one of the things I've tried to apply in the sphere of uh, artificial intelligence critique is a, a critique of the models of the developing self um, that you know, Buddhism is very concerned with uh, how we develop the illusion of self. It is, and for Buddhists, it's an illusion. Um, and it comes about through an embodied experience of sense data that all seems to circle around a particular set of experiences and memory that then you create this illusion called yourself. So when, um, when roboticists 
talk blithely about how they're just going to create incredibly complex machines, but they're not going to provide any of the similar kind of developmental experiences, a sense data, body experience, you know, proprioception, all the kinds of things that go into the creation of a sense of self in a child. I think they are incredibly naive. There are computer scientists who are working on that. So there are computer scientists who are trying to develop some of that, for instance, in Second Life, to give uh, bodies to um, robotic AI and have them interaction, interact with other people around rules of physics so that you actually have to think about moving your arm and having sense data come through that arm and things like that. So I think that they might see some progress through that. Just to answer the first or second question, uh, no, it was the first question about uh, the uh, limitation of uh, AI. Uh, I agree with you, the traditional AI, first AI, uh, uh, restricted just to uh, 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 the uh, abstract uh, uh, way of, of reasoning. And, and the Turing test is, uh, is, is typical of this kind of, of AI. But now uh, AI has changed, and, and you have many, many other uh, uh, work, and some people are discussing about the re relevancy of the, of the Turing test. And as, as, as was said, uh, there are different projects. For instance, uh, um, I remember in Europe there was a, a project of developmental robotics uh, which was uh, named Xpero, and the idea was to build robots which were able to experiment their environment, uh, to build tests, and, and so they were embodied in, in, in a way. So you have many, many experiments in, 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 in this respect, and so it is, it is, it is really evolving. So I, I, I think it's answer to, you, to, to your question. Um, concerning the second point, how would it be possible to uh, uh, have uh, some kind of interdisciplinary uh, 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 contact? I think it's, 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 very, it's very difficult, and I think there is no only one solution. Uh, 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 it is required sometimes to have project to work together on some very precise uh, question. Uh, but uh, um, it, is, it requires very often uh, 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 before this project to understand the language of each other. So it takes a, a lot of time. And uh, what is very useful also is to have some kind of summer school. I mention here the uh, 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 Dartmouth College, which is not only a conference. Conferences are useful, but the idea to have to, to be in the same place for one week or maybe ten days or, or a little bit more is very important because we can take this time uh, 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 to exchange, to discuss each other, and to try to be sure that we understand each other. So. Uh, as a conclusion, there is not one, on, only one solution. And another, another solution also is to have some uh, institute or some laboratory uh, where people coming from uh, uh, different uh, area uh, uh, share the same, uh, 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 the same uh, 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 place and where they can, can exchange and build projects to, together. Okay, we're running out of time. Let's maybe make one last question, maybe a question uh, perhaps over there. Yes, yes. Uh, hello. Uh, this comment is primarily directed at Hughes. I uh, just wanted to comment that although experimental philosophy and specifically as empirical moral psychology has really started in the 90s and especially in the past 10 years, the trolley problem that you mentioned has been in the discourse since I'd say the late 1950s if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and in the article in which Philippa Foote introduced this problem, she did make a specific point of addressing the difference between, say, pushing a lever and pushing someone onto the tracks. Uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson has also dealt with this problem extensively. While some have tried to say that it might be nothing more than, say, a psychological mistake to believe that, to believe that these two things are different, there's definitely a large amount of moral theorists who would say that there are significant differences involving rights and abilities towards other people, and that I don't think you can just reduce this to a problem with our meat brains or anything of that sort. Uh, that is all. There, there's a difference between saying that uh, philosophically you could create a Kantian or a deontological or utilitarian distinction between the two. Absolutely. 
Um, and saying, what happens in the brains of people when you actually ask them that question, when the people who are not philosophers, who are not ethicists? That's what experimental philosophy has been doing. They've been putting people on fMRI scanners and seeing which parts of our brain light up. When you ask somebody, would you pull the lever? It's a rational part of our brain. When you ask somebody, would you push someone on the tracks? It's the horror disgust part of the brain. It's a very different uh, cognition. So, in other words, experimental philosophy is not so concerned about these, uh, these top-down a priori ethical questions. They're concerned about what's actually happening from our simian heritage brains when we confront these situations. Any final comments from the panel? Would you like to make any? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to Roger, and thank you to the college for helping put this together.